hello there, today I'm going to be speaking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So before I start properly speaking about the novel, I'm going to bring up three key points. First thing is first, read it. It is a work of gothic, romantic-esque genius. Second point, Frankenstein is the doctor, not that doctor, but Dr. Victor Frankenstein, the scientist slash doctor who actually made the creation. The monster is not Frankenstein. And though I knew this before reading the novel, it annoys the crap out of me now that people refer to the monster as Frankenstein. The monster doesn't have a name at all. He's often referred to as demon or like creature or creation or whatever, but never actually a name. And certainly not Frankenstein. Third point, Mary Shelley is the coolest person ever. Many, many people say she wrote the book when she was 16, although a lot of other people say she wrote it when she was 18. Regardless, Frankenstein was published in 1818, and seeing as Shelley was born in 1797, this makes her 21 when the book came out, so she at least wrote part of it while she was a teenager. Mary Shelley is also largely attributed to being the creator of science fiction in general. Much of what we see now in popular science fiction is greatly influenced by Shelley's work and the works that came after Shelley as a result of this book here. <laughs> She's also considered a great impetus for the rise of the gothic genre in and of itself. In league with Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, Robert Louis Stevenson, um, Sheridan Le Fanu, and the like. So just an outline of gothic literature. Gothic is the answer to romanticism in the same way that Modernism is an answer to realism. So key features of the previous literary generation get skewed and changed to suit the new writers whose works become the new literary canon. Shelley wrote Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus at the very cusp of this new generation of literature. Hence why she's considered one of the very major people who propelled it further. And because of this you can see a lot of facets from romanticism in Frankenstein. Those genre parameters are what give the book really pastoral, beautiful imagery, but it is the central facets of gothic literature that make the book so terrifying. Okay, for the plot, the book is way too dense for me to be able to speak about everything, so I'm going to give a brief summary, and for those of you who haven't read it, um, I will let you guys know before I spoil any of the major ending things. So firstly, I'm going to speak about structural framing. Basically with this book, it is a story that's set within a story, within a story, within a story. So that's three tiers of story. Although if you really want to analyze it, you can analyze two more tiers, making it a five-tiered story. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to look at the central three frames. The first frame is that of Walton, who is a budding young explorer. He's rather embarrassed about his lack of education, and he wants to be the person who makes the next big scientific discovery. So he has taken a crew and a ship up to the Arctic and he wants to make that discovery basically. Until they find this person out in the snow who is looking for something, it's the monster. And the stranger in the mist is basically Dr. Victor Frankenstein. So very quickly in the book we dive into the next tier, in which Victor tells Walton basically everything about his life. The fact that he was born in Geneva, his upbringing, the fact that he went to university. He then goes on to tell him that while he was at university he became obsessed with the idea of animating a life from nothing. So essentially Victor Frankenstein spent years and years obsessing over creating the monster. And in doing so he completely exhausted himself, he made himself really really sick, um, and he gave himself really bad mental illness, mostly anxiety and paranoia. So eventually, once he's like really disheveled, he finishes making this thing and he realizes that it is evil and horrible and disgusting looking. He then has a massive mental breakdown and faints and the monster, very hurt and rejected, is unleashed unto the world. Now, to speak about the next frame, we're heading into spoiler territory. So if you haven't read the book yet and you want to read it, you should probably go to this time um, to avoid any major spoilers. So basically what the monster does is flees from the study slash laboratory and he finds himself in the forest. He spends the next few years um, teaching himself how to speak and how to read by watching this family in this cottage out in the countryside. Eventually he grows really really lonely and alienated because he doesn't have any companions, he's very much aware that he's the only of his species and he goes to speak to the family he's been watching for all of this time. He is obviously rejected by the family because of his grotesque appearance and in doing so he becomes very hurt again and gets really really mad about it and burns down the family's house. <laughs> he then, as revenge for being created, decides to go and find Frankenstein who has been trying to forget everything that's happened um, 
and the monster ends up killing his brother. Basically, the rest of the novel follows how the monster wants Frankenstein to craft him a wife because he feels really, really lonely, um, and Frankenstein decides not to do it because he doesn't want to like, unleash this demon spawn species onto the world. And then the monster starts trying to get revenge on him for meddling with science and life and God and all of, all of that stuff. So the main spoilers are this, I think. Everyone friggin' dies. Everyone dies. <laughs> Shelley is like the OG heart ripper Asher way before the likes of Shonda Rhimes or JK Rowling. Everyone but Walton essentially dies. The only one that you can kind of dispute is the monster, although it is assumed that he dies because it's framed both sides of the narrative. So when the monster's narrative ends, Frankenstein's narrative ends, we're left with Walton on the ship. Frankenstein is very, very sick, he's very ill. Um, and he passes away, but with a lot of lament and regret. The monster who's been trailing them the entire time realizes that his creator has died. He gets really, really upset that he's killed, you know, Frankenstein's wife, his both of his brothers, um, his friend when they were in Ireland, and has been basically the cause of his father's death. And then he decides to kill himself and runs off the ship onto a raft and he implies that he's going to set it on fire basically. So it's assumed that he dies too. Walton's really just left with this massive story and Victor Frankenstein is dead in his study and then the monsters just fled. This really ties back to the liturgical religious imagery. Walton gets left to pick up the pieces uh, as representative of Adam. So if you consider uh, Frankenstein to be the creator, so God, um, Walton is Adam, and then the monster is Lucifer. There's also much of an argument for Victor Frankenstein embodying all three aspects of this. So you consider that when he's young, he is Adam. He's basically handed his wife, Elizabeth, from his own creator, his father, as a gift. He believes that she belongs to him. Um, so it's very, very possessive, kind of like Adam and Eve. So he turns into God, fostering life, and then, because of his sin, falls from grace and becomes Lucifer. So in terms of liturgical imagery, it's very, very circular with this Adam, God, Lucifer imagery. Now if we consider pastoral or natural imagery, this is one of my favourite parts of the novel, which is wonderfully juxtaposed against the gothic overtone of the rest of the novel. This is a snippet from the monster's frame as he's describing what it was like to basically wake up in the forest and discover his senses. Several changes of day and night passed and the orb of night had greatly lessened when I began to distinguish my senses from each other. I gradually saw plainly the clear stream that supplied me with drink and the trees that shaded me with their foliage. I was delighted when I first discovered that a pleasant sound, which often saluted my ears, proceeded from the throats of the tiny winged animals who had often intercepted the light from my eyes. I began also to observe with greater accuracy the forms that surrounded me and to perceive the boundaries of the radiant roof of light which canopied me. So you can see that the monster is like really, really eloquent and he's smart and he's moral uh, until these horrible things happen to him and he gets really vicious and mean and starts killing everyone. Also kind of cute that he cares about the little sounds that the birds make. <laughs> so yeah, in the book there is a lot of nighttime and misery and then there's just these beautiful little snippets of tiny tweeting birds and like foliage and the sun and it's just really really lovely. And the novel is set between Germany, so the German countryside, and the Swiss Alps, which also lends itself to being described really, really beautifully. The Swiss Alps actually bring me to my next point, which is that of classical mythology. I love mythology. So when I was reading this, I got really, really excited that the subtext for the novel was the modern Prometheus. If you're unaware of the myth of Prometheus, basically uh, Prometheus is the titan who stole fire from God and gave it to the humans because his brother, who crafted them out of clay, um, accidentally made humans really, really stupid. And Prometheus was like, oh my god, no, because they don't have any claws or talons and they're going to be really cold because they don't have any clothes. So Prometheus went and stole fire from Zeus and gave it to the humans. Um, and as a punishment for this, Prometheus was then strung up on a rock in the Swiss Alps where a vulture was to eat his liver like out of his stomach every single day while his liver regenerated. And that was supposed to be how he was for the rest of eternity. Frankenstein is supposed to be the modern Prometheus. It's quite easy to analyse the novel from the perspective of classical mythology. I loved doing it. I did it in my essay for university. Unfortunately, that's all I'm going to have time to speak about today. There are oodles and oodles and oodles of things you can continue to speak about with Frankenstein. As I said, it is so dense, it's so intricate, 
I haven't even scraped the surface of themes that you can speak about. But this is of course just the book in a nutshell. Please let me know if you've read it, what you thought of it, and if you intend to read it. I hope you enjoyed the video and have a lovely day.